You're listening to The Western Rookie, a hunting podcast full of tips, tricks, and strategies from seasoned Western hunters. There are plenty of opportunities out there. We just need to learn how to take on the challenges. Hunting is completely different up there. I've harvested 26 big game animals. You can fool their eyes, but you can't fool their nose. The 300 yards back to the road turned into three miles back the other way. It's always cool seeing new hunters go and harvest an animal. I don't know what to expect. If there's anybody I want in the woods with me, it'll be you. Welcome back to another Western Rookie Podcast episode. I'm your host, Brian Krebs, and today I have Maddie Woodward on the call. And Maddie is not only a very accomplished and dedicated Western hunter, but you also work for Nosler. So how is your day going, Maddie? It's good. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to talk hunting. Thanks for being here. Um, I've been very conscious to make sure I don't just have buddies and male perspectives on the podcast because there's a lot of females that like hunting and like Western hunting. And my wife is starting to get more and more into it as well, which kind of helps remind me like there's a whole um, demographic out there that probably is very underrepresented in podcasting. And so I think there's some really interesting things to talk about in that regard um i've had a couple of recently had a couple of like couples that like that hunt which is kind of rare to have two people regardless of gender that just love it the same amount and it's like their their one thing in life is to hunt together yeah it's like if you don't want to come that's fine but i'm still going and then on both sides of the relationship so that's very cool then i found out you mentioned that because when you first reached out to me you asked if my husband clark could be on the podcast too and He's actually guiding this week, um, so he's not able to join us. But, yeah, we love it the same, but <laughs> we butt heads when we hunt, too. Yeah, if you have different styles, too. I, so did you both grow up in hunting families? We did, but we grew up hunting very differently, which is where, like, right. I – I love that time with him in the woods and I value it and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But sometimes I'm like, okay, you go your way. I'm going to go my way and we'll reconvene later. Yeah. I've, that's where I was getting at is, you know, if you grew up with your parents, maybe brothers and your dad, uncles, and you hunted your way and then your husband or, you know, either direction, your spouse grows up with their family hunting their way. And then you come together. You're like, well, this is how I hunt. And you're like, well, no, that's not it. Right. Like this is how I hunt. And I could see it be very different. So my wife grew up in a family, very avid fishermen. They hunted, but they didn't hunt um, maybe as much or it just different than me. Mm-hmm. And and then she was going through med school and all that stuff. So she pretty much put it down for like eight years. So she like gets it. She's gone with me and she like understands how things work, but she hasn't done it enough where she's like very trenched into a way of hunting. And so it's mm-hmm. kind of more like, I would say like she's still very open minded to like trying different things and basically, you know, molding her style of hunting towards the way I've been hunting my whole life. She didn't have that like two decades of experience doing it her way. Now I have two decades of experience doing it my way and we have to find a way to make it work. But that's the same as the last couple that I had on. That's the same exact story. I mean, like I talked to the husband and his wife was growed up hunting just as much as him or even more and had his way and her way and and so it's very interesting I I feel like that'd be like a real challenge especially like tensions can run hot when there's like a big bull or a big buck out there and you're like I think we should do this and you're like no I want to stay here and and like stay put and be patient not mess this up yeah it definitely it, it it challenges us for sure I there's a lot of value that we both have to add and I will say since hunting with him some of the ways that I hunt in, in certain situations has changed. And he's taught me so many things that I like never even considered before. And I like to think that it's vice versa as well, but there's, there's still times where we're like stuck in our ways. Yeah. And I got to imagine that it's at some point you're like, especially if you're like in the dating phase of relationship where you're both like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it that way. And and really, you're just like, I want to do anything but that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And well, it just comes like, you know, marriage, sacrifice. Yeah. You got you got to meet in the middle. You got to sacrifice. It's just another part of it. 
Do you have? Do you and, and your husband have like a either a tag or a season or an, a species that is like your thing? Like I would say, I'm a white tail hunter that loves elk hunting, but uh, the white tail is my thing. Uh huh. Um, he loves archery hunting mule deer, like big mule deer. That is. Mm-hmm. He's diehard for it. He'll pass up 160, 170 inch bucks year after year because he's after that one big buck. And mine is more so archery elk hunting. We try not to, we both like archery hunt and rifle hunt just kind of depends on states, tags. We really go where we have the most opportunity to hunt, whether that's like hunting archery here, hunting Idaho rifle or, you know, a muzzleloader tie or what it might be. But we try not to stack our tags. So we try to hunt like for one person specifically for this season. And then the next person, like we try not to both be hunting at the same time. Oh, it doesn't so, always work. But So you, I thought you meant I, we try not to like have it. So he's got a mule deer tag. I have an elk tag the same week, same unit. And we're doing both. But you're saying like maybe like we only have one elk tag between the two of us and whoever's got the tag is the shooter and the other person's the caller, or we have one mule deer tag and we have like a spotter shooter, like not two yeah. mule deer tags or two elk tags. Yeah. Or we'll alternate years. So like this year, well, we both are tree hunted this year for elk and deer. Um, but sometimes we'll be like, okay, I'll archery hunt this year. You rifle hunt this year so that the seasons don't stack on top of each other. Okay, that makes sense. I really do understand the whole, like, the you have a mule deer tag, I have an elk tag, let's go out and see what happens mentality. Because yeah. typically, like, I've done that many times where I, like, Montana's a great example. You can get the deer tag for basically 150 bucks if you yeah. buy the big game combo. But when you're elk hunting, you're elk hunting. And there's, like, very rare chances that it's going to work for a deer. And if, especially if you're deer hunting, like, most of the time the elk aren't where, like, the deer population centers are like you could find a mule deer while you're elk hunting. You rarely find an elk while you're mule deer hunting. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I'm done doing that dual hunt thing. Like this doesn't, it's never worked. I've done it three or four times and I've never tagged out whatever tag was the uh, bonus. Never even mm-hmm. thought of it. I just, you know, came back maybe a later season and hunted that tag specifically. Yeah. Um, but I would be, yeah, the, that would not work. I'm a little surprised. So if you, I take it you've tried, like, if you both have the same tag, like, if you both have an archery elk tag, it just still kind of friction. It works. Um, and I don't necessarily think that there's, like, a lot of friction or competition. We both are very supportive of the other one. I want the other person to be successful. And if I'm being 100% honest, like, we're both after a different caliber of animal. Okay. So I'm more like fill the freezer. I want to shoot a mature animal, but I'm like fill the freezer. He's like hold out for a few years until he can get the exact animal he wants. Okay. Well, that could be very easy because then it's like whatever elk we call in, one of us is going to get a shot. Yeah. yeah it yeah. kind of, it kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it would be harder to be in his position because it's not like if you're the shooter and it turns out to be a giant bull, you're just going to want to be like, oh no, you shoot it. Yeah. No, I'm not right. going to be like, Whoa. No, yeah. We felt that. I mean, we hunt archery elk with a group and our group is usually eight, six to eight people that everyone has a tag. And so then you have to cycle through callers and shooters. Sometimes mm-hmm. the situation just decides for you. Um, my brother has shot, I think four or five bulls now with his bow. Wow. So generally he just kind of gravitates towards being a caller. Cause there's people in our group that have never shot an elk at all, much less with a bow. Uh-huh. And so he'll just, kind of he'll be caller like this year he was i think caller every day and we just didn't have enough situation like interactions and setups that were like working out Mm -hmm. for like you to switch he's like well i'll be the nothing's really going on so i don't really mind being the caller if it was like we're getting into 12 setups a day it's like yeah i'll do you know one then you do one then i'll do one yes yeah and i would say too as i become more accomplished like i absolutely love hunting love shooting animals but I've found like this love for seeing other people be successful, especially Mm -hmm. new hunters um, and people that are like very near and dear to me. So I'm just, I just love being out there for the adventure. I love hunting it. And whether I kill the animal or someone else does, I love it all the same. I hear you. I, I had never really done much of that because I grew up in a family and my family was very, um, I would say traditional. 
deer camp. Um, everyone comes together, pheasant hunting, like set like 30 years of that tradition. Mm -hmm. And then when I started getting like through high school, my brother started getting more into the Western hunting. Then we started adding on top of that. But I was for a long time, the youngest person in my family that hunts together. And so everyone else was like, had already done and been there and done that for almost everything. And so I was the one that everyone else was like trying to help as I was growing up. And so then my brother started having kids. My brother's 24 years older than me. He's a half brother. So okay. we're almost like a full generation off. And so like his kids are only a few years younger than me. And so then it was me trying to help like my nephews mm -hmm. get their first year. And it was really fun because I brought my one nephew. We did this like three antelope tags, three mule deer tags hunt in Wyoming. And this is another example of like, the nephews are lucky. They pull it off. They both shot their antelope and their mule deer, but I only had the mule deer take because I'm like, I'm just going to focus on one. But I was able to bring him out and shoot his first mule deer. And um, he was a small feller back then. I mean, not a big person at all. He was like 14 and like not a big 14 year old. And he shoots this mule deer and he's got like a book bag, like a camo backpack, but not what it didn't have load lifters. It didn't have a waist strap. And so I'm like, I'll pack this out for you. He's like, no, no, I want to pack out half. I'm like, okay, well, I'll give you half, but I'll pack out the heads. So, like, you could take half the deer, half the buck, yeah. I'll take half. He puts it in his book bag and just starts booking it uphill, straight mile to the truck. We got back in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. For him. Yeah, I mean, he was just like a little, little energizer bunny. It was crazy. I'm just impressed. I'm like, you know, I knew I could pack out half a deer at once. Yeah. I've done some pretty heavy packouts. And I'm a big guy. Like, I'm 6'2", 250 at the time, and he's, I don't know maybe 100 pounds that's awesome what a stud i didn't think that story was going to go that direction no he was <laughs> i and then the whole thing is like i've had bad backpacks and i've had good backs like now we have all mystery ranch packs in our family okay. and it, yeah. you can it's like you can carry twice as much weight and it feels the same it's amazing but to, mm -hmm. i imagine like putting a half of a buck in a book bag <laughs> just yeah go. no I carried his rifle for him too. Just to, that was more for a safety aspect. I didn't want him to trip and fall and yeah. have something happen. Which is oh my gosh, this is the first time I've had a podcast since this weekend. Unfortunately, this is not a, a happy story. We were hunting back home at the farm this weekend, and I get a call from my buddy that hunts the neighboring farm. When we've gone out west together, and he said, "Hey, can you see the person, the kid that was walking on the neighbor's property, the third neighbor?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I saw him earlier." He didn't look like he was wearing blaze orange though, which is kind of weird. And I have a big stand for whitetails that I can look over this whole valley with a spotting scope. And he goes, we heard a shot. And then we heard some like really weird so sounds. We couldn't tell if it was like someone screaming or a deer screaming or like groaning from like a bad shot. Then we saw him crawling and we were wondering if he was like trying to sneak up on a deer. And then he just got up and walked away, but he took his jacket off. He took his blaze orange off. He didn't have his gun. And so we're going back and forth. Like I'm asking questions because I couldn't find him in the spotting scope. And it's like he, my buddy was thinking like it, like it looked like he sh probably wounded a deer and was trying to like sneak up on it. And I'm like, I don't know what you're telling me. It sounds like he shot himself. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't figure it out. Well, all of a sudden, the ambulances start no. flying down our gravel road. And we're in the middle of nowhere. Like there's, it's not like it's the highway that they would just take anyway. And so I call my buddy back. I'm like, hey, there's ambulances coming from my side. Like you guys better go try to find him. I'll keep looking. And so they're running across their property and then a chop as we're on the phone, a chopper comes over the trees and lands right next to our property. Well, turns out it was a, a seventh grader that kind of everyone knows, like we're all kind of knew the, the dad, he tripped and fell on his way to the stand. He said the safety was on everything. He tripped and fell, hit his cell phone with a slug and it um, took like, I don't know, 90% of the, the energy. And it went into his leg, and but never came out, and he was able to walk home, and they took him in. And I just got a text message yesterday that he's home, no nerve damage, no oh bones, gosh. no joints, just a crazy situation. But he's so lucky, so lucky. It was, an, it was. I couldn't believe it. Like everyone always talks, like anything could happen, but to watch the entire situation unfold, like right before us. And then to know the family so we could like hear the updates of what happened. Like we're, we had no idea what happened. Uh, and then it turns out like, you know, how do you, how do you hit a phone and like all these different things? Why do they need a life flight? If he was able to walk home, like there's a lot of yeah. questions that didn't get answered. turns out like they just called the chopper when they heard that it was a, a GSW and no one knew the details. They figured mm -hmm. they were going to need to bring them to a trauma center. 
but yeah, it's crazy. But I saw the picture of the phone because the property owner went and found his gun and they found the phone too. And it was an iPhone and it was just shattered. Oh. And and that saved, probably saved his life because it That's hit his phone. Crazy. I yeah. always say a safety is a mechanical device that can't fail. Like, uh, yeah. Well, he, the, so he's a seventh grader, so, yeah, and yeah. things happen, but he said it was on safe and he was just walking out and when he tripped and fell, the gun came. Oh, it, oh. Yeah. So he's like, I mean, it just shows, goes to show like anything can happen. And a lot of people like to walk, like hunt with a, a round in the chamber yeah, yeah. in case you jump something. But I don't know. That story has me second guessing that. I mean, I don't even like to take running shots anyway, so. I think usually when I rifle hunt in the West, I don't have one in the chamber. Yeah, it's all circumstantial. I mean, for me, it depends. It definitely depends. Yeah. But just very thankful he's home. He was walking. Um, apparently, there's a video of him going upstairs with his crutches already. I mean, not he oh, obviously one so leg at lucky. a time. One leg at a time. Well, the landowner said he was just very stubborn and wanted to live. <laughs> and, like, he's just like, yeah, he's just a stubborn kid and just walked back. <laughs> so we found out he took his jacket off because he got hot, um, which, I don't know, maybe could have been the opposite. Like, it could have been hypothermia because hypothermia makes you feel hot. So yeah. who knows? But, yeah, very lucky, very lucky. And uh, just obviously no one wants to hear that happening. But for it happening, it went about as well as it probably could have. Yeah. He got 30 crazy. stitches and they took out all the the um pieces and now he's home. So. Oh. Yeah, it very is it is crazy. And I just want to tell a story just like keep in mind like it it is worth the extra 2 seconds to like yes. go to the, that next level of safety, like unload your gun before you climb up into a stand or or crossing fence lines. It's a big one. It sounded like he might have been trying to cross a, like a fallen tree. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, it's a crazy story. But with that out of the way, we could go back to the, the. It just happened. Like it's just, it's been on my mind all week because it was just this last weekend that this whole situation happened. So crazy. Yeah, it's also very thankful that he wasn't using like a high power slug. Apparently, because I like an, an iPhone's not very thick, and no. you, like these bullets are made to go like you know pass throughs at well, shotguns only really a hundred yards, but like a rifle bullet's made to go on a pass through up to like four, five hundred, six hundred yards. Yeah. So as it was very crazy, but Dang. what I was going to ask you right before that story just jumped into my mind was, do you, do you have a bias between being hunting with a rifle since you work for a rifle ammunition manufacturer, or do you still love the bow just as much? Oh, I still love the bow. Yeah. Just as much. Well, I wouldn't even say just as much. I'm going to say more. <laughs> more. Um, yeah. So I grew up rifle hunting. I didn't pick up a bow until late in high school um and there is nothing like archery hunting elk you just can't beat it i love rifle hunting but archery hunting elk calling them close like this this archery season i had some fairly high standards i said i was going for a 300 inch six point or bust i ended up hunting 28 days in september and when i say i had a lot of close interactions with elk it was like a lot and it's so cool just like seeing elk whether it's cows or bulls just seeing them come in the way that they move like the way that they respond to your calling it's so neat and i feel like you you don't get that when you're hunting with a rifle no but i'll ask you this if you could if you got a tag that was any weapon during the rut which one would you bring oh a rifle okay i just wanted to check <laughs> It's cool, so funny be because like during archery season, you know, I'll be like 120 yards from a giant bull. And I'm like, hmm, he doesn't want to come in. Really wish I had a rifle right now. Like I could have shot <laughs> some huge bulls if I had a rifle, but yeah, yeah. Well, I've been there. I, I drew the once in a lifetime North Dakota elk tag the first year I applied. And that is a, I think it was like September 6th through December 31st, any weapon. Mm -hmm. So that you get three solid months of elk hunting with any weapon. And so I shot my bull on September 8th with a rifle. That's so cool. Yeah. I shot the first bull yeah. I saw hunting, but it was, it was the, one of the biggest bulls I saw summer scouting. So, yeah, I would say I love the challenge of archery hunting. I think not that I'm like some super proficient rifle hunter by any means, but I really do love the challenge of, of archery hunting. 
I love it too. And I think every, oh, how do I say this? If you could just give me the option of it working out either way, I would pick my bow every time. Like it's, just, it would be so much more fun to use my bow. The problem is you get that bull at 120 yards or like this weekend, I had a monster 10 point white tail. We've been chasing for two years. He's going to be somewhere in like the 160, 170 range. And he was at 200 yards for an hour. Uh, and I have a shotgun that yeah. I am very confident to 150. So, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like doing math, trying to calculate the drop just to know like, what if he gets to 175 or 160, yeah. like all these different things. And it never worked out, but I shoot a 300 wind mag rifle. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to shoot like very fast monolithic bullets lately with it. And so I like 200 yards would have been like a dream shot at any yeah. big game animal. So yeah, it was a real bummer. It was a real I mean, bummer. I hope you get him. <laughs> well, we have our muzzleloader season coming up. Um, Minnesota is um, actually really similar to the West. You can bow hunt the entire fall, and then they'll have like a one-week shotgun season and then like a two-week muzzleloader season. Oh, so that's awesome. Yeah, now there's like – there's some really cool improvements with long range muzzleloaders. That was that's a great ass topic. Does does Nosler have any um, either like muzzleloader bullets available or in the works? Uh, so we did have well, we did we do have a 45 cal Sabo muzzleloader bullet. It's a ballistic tip. Um, we haven't honestly run them in a couple years just because our demand starting with COVID and now going into yeah. another presidential election year, our demand has been through the roof. So we're really picking and choosing what we're producing based on demand. Uh, but yeah, we, we do. Unfortunately, Oregon is so traditional. We, our muzzleloaders have to be open ignition. They can't have sights or scopes or yeah. I had a muzzleloader tag this last year and I shot my buck at 47 yards. That's with, so <laughs> open ignition, you're talking like a flint and pan. Oh, well, I guess no, they changed it to closed ignition just last year. It was open ignition up until then. So opening, is that what that means? I don't even know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now oh, it's boy. closed, but you can't, I mean, you can only see so far with open sights. Yeah, like a peep sight gun or an iron sights gun. I mean, you're talking like 100 yards yeah. before your pin starts to, like, take up the entire vitals. Yep, that yeah. was the, the scenario we ran into. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, good for you. That's a great a great shot with the muzzleloader. Um, but ballistic tips, so that's like an ex – is that a – I assume that's an explosive tip? No, it's not. So – it kind of sounds that way, um, but it's not. It's still a mushrooming bullet. It just has a like a polymer tip on it to help with. Oh, the ballistic know. coefficient. That's yes. what you're talking about. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh. yeah, we call it our ballistic tip, but yeah, it's still a mushrooming bullet. You want to? So I, I just look at things a lot of times, and I think I know what it means. But for a long time, I thought the E tip was an explosive tip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> the E tip is. It's the monolithic is, copper, right? It is, yeah. yeah. So many people are like, I'm not going to shoot that because it stands for eco-friendly like, or like explosive. Like people make up their own names on it. I it thought it stands for expansion tip. Expansion tip. Well, that's almost everything, right? Like a lot of – all hunting bullets are made with some version of an expansion tip, right? Yes. We're rebranding this bullet in 2024. Okay. Exciting. Yeah. I, that, yes, uh, hopefully that is, that's not a secret. Uh, no. Okay. It's not. Um, but yeah, that bullet has great performance. Yeah. I think well, that that's one of the things we haven't really hit home with that bullet is just because it's lead free. Like you could, you don't have to live in California to use a lead free bullet. You know what I mean? Like it has great performance and it hits like a truck. I have been a, um, I'd say a convert. I, we used to shoot like a partition yeah. um, on everything for years. And then my brother actually is the one that um, kind of started bringing it up in our family. He saw a study somewhere where they shot a deer. They don't, I don't want to say it that way. A hunter harvested a deer and then they x-rayed it, right? They didn't just go out and shoot a deer for science, you know, <laughs> but a hunter harvested a deer and then they x-rayed it and they found lead particles everywhere. Like, mm -hmm. like a double lung shot and there's a lead particle in its recorder. 
like okay. because of the because lead bullets just typically fragment mm-hmm. you know on impact and so i don't know you probably know this better than i i've used the number at like high speeds a lead bullet can lose up to 20 percent of its mass yeah i think it yeah it so ours aren't known for fragmenting by any means um so you're not going to lose a ton of that lead in your meat but there i mean there's potential for that in any lead bullet just because the makeup of lead it's right. softer than copper yeah uh, but yeah it's funny because even some of our engineers are like i don't know why people don't use the e-tip bullet even more so than the partition because its performance is crazy and i was actually talking to uh a guy named Jeremiah, he owns from Field to Table. I'm not sure if you've heard of him before, but he was talking about how he shoots the E-tip for that for that reason as well, because he's big on, you know, the consumption of the meat after the fact, and that's kind of like his main focus. But right. he was saying that as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of things can happen. It depends on your speeds and velocities, and then like a big thing, like arrows, it's obviously critical to not hit like major bones. But with guns too, like yeah, you'll probably still get your elk if you hit it in the shoulder with a with a properly sized you know caliber and bullet. Yeah. But like if you hit an elk in the shoulder with a you know a bullet, like anything can happen. Like I hit my North Dakota bull on the third shot in the spine, and that bullet was a disaster. Like there was lead everywhere. I had, unfortunately I had to cut out like a six inch section of backstrap, which was like the worst cut. I made a mistake and I shot him. I hit him the first shot at 375. He rolled down a hill. I think I just tripped. Like, I think he just like got startled and misstepped and he was on a steep surface. So he rolled down. I'm like, Oh, perfect. One shot. He stands up. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, whatever. He starts walking towards me at a quartering angle. So I shot again. He just like took it shot again and this was a 200 grain bullet out of a 300 wind mag and he just ate three bullets in a row as he was walking towards me and the fourth one i just didn't adjust my elevation at all even though he came 100 yards closer and accidentally hit like six inches high instead Mm -hmm. and the luckily the spine shot ended things really fast but that bullet hit a major bone and it was frag i think it lost like 80 percent of its mass it was not a well i don't shoot that bullet anymore and I don't want to say the brand name or anything. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a, it is a well-known bullet. I just wanted to go to an E-tip. I wanted to go to a fully monolithic bullet for partly that reason. The other part is they shoot really fast. They are. Because yeah. you, can, you can get them a little bit lighter. And I've been reading, I read this old, old book. And like it's, it's so old. Like Part of the book was written by Teddy Roosevelt about oh. hunting. Yeah, it's, it's like this deer hunter's handbook. It should probably have it on my library yeah right over there the deer hunters book and a couple chapters are written by like teddy roosevelt and he commented how he had been seeing on his ranch in north dakota that the the he called them the gentlemen that shoot the faster bullets seem to drop more deer in their tracks Mm -hmm. and he thought it was it was interesting because a lot of people thought a heavier bullet would was better and so i've been kind of playing with that and so what i'd love to do is find a 150 grain e-tip in a 300 wind mag and shoot it at like 3,300 feet per second. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would say there's, I mean, people believe like have their opinions on both sides of that. And I think that there's truth to both sides. Yeah. Yeah, there is. And I mean like a lead bullet, like if you get more expansion and if you did get like, I know some bullets are designed to fragment. They're designed to not have exit wounds at all. Mm-hmm. And they have some merits, like when you have 100% energy transfer to your animal, like that's going to cause damage. That's going to cause a lot more hemorrhage and a lot more yes. um, shock. But I like I don't want fragments all over. Like I'd rather take my chances with a quality place, you know, double lung and two holes and a blood trail. Yeah, yeah. It was so our AccuBond is really well known for having that having a larger wound channel from the mushrooming and then transferring all of its energy without exiting. The AccuBond's a really good bullet too. Yeah. Well, they're all three are like phenomenal. And I, I've yeah. listened to, the, so ever since I started following Randy Newberg, I mentioned this, I think a while ago um, when I, when I first asked you to come on the podcast, but since I started following Randy Newberg, probably eight years ago, he was still doing on your own adventures. Like mm-hmm. he was a couple seasons into that and he was talking about Nosler and when you're a Midwest guy that uses shotguns, like you don't hear a lot about Nosler growing up because, yeah. you, you know, you don't make 12 gauge bullets. 
And so I was like, oh man, that sounds like a really cool story. And then I heard from John the story of like how the partition bullet came to be with like moose hunting in Alaska and his dad was a truck driver and like he understood how like the mass behind the truck really drives the truck. The, the, mm-hmm. the truck just steers the load and it was like, that's awesome. So then I went to like full nozzler with everything. Cause I just think it's cool to buy stuff from like a family company and not, you know, somebody with a board of directors and on the stock exchange. <laughs> so Yeah, no, definitely. And we appreciate that. It's a very tight knit community we have here at Nosler. Like the Nosler family is still in the office every single day. And it's really neat. I feel like very blessed to work in an environment like this because I truly believe in not only our product, but also the people. Yeah, I've heard it from almost everyone that has ever interacted with the Nosler brand. Nothing but good things to say about it, which is very like when you think about that, it's very rare in today's day and age where like a person or a brand can have like unanimous support and approval. Like even people like, oh, I don't shoot Nosler, but they're great people, mm-hmm. you know, because there's like it's so easy for someone to like have a negative opinion out there. And it seems like there's certain brands that you know, especially if they're still like family owned and, and they, they are like, they're a tighter knit um, community. It's a, you see some of those brands that are, you know, just known for excellence. And I think like your neighbors right across the street are another brand with Leopold. I mean, everyone that ever works with them, is like, well, I don't use Leopold, but the, you know, I've talked to them or I've met them and they're phenomenal people. Yes, they are. So, so I think it's really cool. I think it's, um, like Randy says, we shoot all three, the E-tip, the partition, the Acubon. It, it's very, I would love to like have, I bet he's got a chart of like what he's hunting and like the season and caliber. And like, that's how the, he picks which bullet he's going to use. Like if it's an antelope, I want to like really fast bullet or something. If it's an elk, maybe I'd do it this way or that way. But I'm sure like knowing, hearing him talk enough, he's probably got a flow chart of like oh. what to- yeah randy's like an accountant he is very analytical well, I'm a- numbers yeah but he picks so we've talked to him about this a lot and like you said he does shoot the partition the e-tip the acubon and it's more so like every rifle is very individual so it's like humans like they have their own mm. preferences and so with randy he talked a lot to us about how each of his rifles depending on like what caliber he's shooting likes its own specific bullet so he just finds like which one of those three shoots the best in that Mm. rifle and he's like really into 308 win 270 win some of the more classics 300 win mag um but yeah it kind of depends on a the game he's hunting and then really what his rifle likes okay does he comment because i I know he's probably got like uh cases of rifles i met with the steelhead outdoors his gun safe Uh brand they're right here in my backyard and they're a sponsor of this show as well. After I heard them on, on Randy's show and they talked about, it was like crazy for this guy to call us up and say, yeah, I want three gun safes. And then he ordered another one. So I'm sure, and he has guests on and employees. Like I'm sure he's got like rifle after rifle after rifle. Does he cut, does he notice that like if he had two of the exact same rifles and the exact same caliber, one gun might like an Acubon more than a partition or is it more like, this rifle caliber and built like this whole, like if you get the same one, it's probably fine. It's more when you just like switch calibers and switch rifle you, platforms. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Barrel length caliber rifle platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's more like controversy between folks on which broadhead is the best for like elk or which bullet is the best for big game? Mm. I don't know either. I thought about this as we were talking. I don't know. I'm on a lot of the forums for, especially just like from working in Osler, I like to see what everyone else is saying and thinking and whatnot. Um, And I don't know that there's necessary, necessarily controversy on the bullet side of things. Maybe not the bullet, but the caliber, (laughs) like they're big caliber people, like the six, five is the best, or they can like a six, five can do anything. And then the other folks think it's more of a hype caliber. And, and, um, so I was, maybe the better question is like, what's a more like highly contested topic, the best broadhead or like the best caliber, the best caliber. I'm sure people love to hate on the six, five creed more. Um, and I'm kind of like in the middle, you know, uh, it has its place. 
I think it's an absolutely, it's a phenomenal cartridge for new hunters, young hunters, people that just want to go shoot, right? you know, whitetail, antelope, coyotes, like it's a great caliber. Would I go shoot an elk with it? No. Yeah. But that's because I have other options that I prefer. Now, at the end of the day, I would say that it's all about bullet placement, velocity, Right. Foot pounds of energy on impact. So taking into all, con- consideration all of those factors, like can you kill an elk with a 6.5 Creedmoor? Yes, but it's not optimal. No, it's – well, and it's – I think it gets down to like so many – there's so much context between like what caliber should you buy, and I think you touched on a lot of them. Like are we talking about like Brian, who's a 6'2", like 250-pound guy that's not afraid of getting beat up? in the shoulder well in that case like and you want to hunt big game like he wants to hunt moose and like elk and things it's like well go to a 300 just pick any quality 300 you'll be fine or are you talking about a 12 year old that's going on their first antelope hunt it's like well don't give them a 300 like my gun weighs 14 pounds so (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. and there's things that can mitigate help mitigate that like um suppressors muzzle brakes you know there's different things you can do even when it comes to bullet weight and powder charge that impacts recoil but i think as far as like the 6.5 creedmoor gets a lot of hate because it became so popular so quick and i think it gets hate from a lot of those guys that weren't willing to try it out but they wanted to stick with their like traditional 30-06 cartridges and not talking down on any of those but it became a huge demand in the market for 6.5 creedmoor rifles and ammunition so some of those other ones took a back seat yeah. And I, I just, I'm an engineer, so I get very analytical about a lot of things. And I, it's, you can almost like track back how it started because the 6.5 Creedmoor is actually a very strong standout in the like 250 to 270 caliber long range gun, right? Like if you look at the ballistics after say 800 yards, that bullet performs like flawlessly. Yeah. Like better than a 308. And a 308 used to be the long range caliber of choice. Mm-hmm. And and so I think what happened, this is my opinion now, is that long range shooters started switching to the 6.5 Creedmoor because it had such great ballistics out at like their thousand yard targets. Yeah. And then hunters were like, oh, if it's such an accurate gun, it must be a better hunting ground mm-hmm. and started buying it. And I like, I don't care either way. I've shot, shot them. They're really fun guns to shoot. Yeah. But I just, it's, I think it's ironic, like just fun to like look back at how it started like oh it's so it's so good at a thousand it must be perfect at 400 but then you pair it up to you know any gun a 28 nozzler a 270 win a 7 mm08 and all of these guns have better ballistic performance out to like 500 yards which is where most yeah. people are hunting to mm-hmm. so yeah that's why i, I just think, like i think it's all funny i <laughs> like people call them like need mores and i think they're great for their intended uses if you had, if if someone has like unlimited resources to throw at firearms, I would have one. I would have like every caliber, and I'd I'd fine tune yeah. it. Like if I'm gonna go on a deer hunt where I know I'm gonna, you know, be shooting longer distances, I think a six five Creedmoor is a great round. Um, yeah. Antelope hunting, great round. Um, th- I wish there was a better one size, like truly fits all lower forty eight rifle. Mm-hmm. And when I built the rifle I had, I was flipping coins between the 28 Nosler and the 300 win. And it was the year the 28 Nosler came out. And it was the year that we had like the massive ammo shortage. Mm -hmm. And that was the deciding factor. And, you know, because I couldn't find any 28 Nosler ammo anywhere local to me because we're out in Minnesota too. So I I went with the 300 win Meg, but I think that 28 Nosler is like really close to approaching the true one size fits all. Yes, I would agree. And it's funny. So I have a 28 Nosler. I don't have a 6.5 Creedmoor, um, but I absolutely love my 28. And when people ask me, like, I have a 7 Red Mag too, and that's another great cartridge. But they're like, so what's this 28 Nosler? What's the difference? They, And I'm like, okay, well, it's still shooting a 284 bullet, so mm-hmm. 7mm, but it's like a 7 Red Mag jacked up. Like, it's a hot rod 7mm. It has a larger case capacity than the 300 Win Mag. And so, so you're getting a really, really fast bullet. Right. And then you can tune it down if you want to hunt antelope. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, because what's a 284? You can get that down to like 143? 
Um, that's just a that's just a, like a guess, a I, guesstimate. <laughs> you yeah, don't have to know I, the answer. I don't know. <laughs> but you can. So I've said that because you can get a three hundred, like a three hundred caliber bullet, down to one fifty, but you can't really go much lower than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, we have seven mm bullets down to one forty. Okay. Yeah. Which is a good choice for for an antelope. I use my three hundred win for antelope. Hunting. I was gonna say dead is dead. I mean. <laughs> And I think part of it is, you know, I shot, and I've only shot one antelope with it. I've only had one tag since I built it. But I was shooting a 180 copper bullet, a monolithic. Mm -hmm. And it, like, the exit hole is the same size as the entry hole. Yeah. There was, like, there was none of the, the waste and damage that a lot of people would tell you you're going to get with a 300. And I was just curious, like, is it because the bullet is so big and the antelope so small it just didn't have time to expand before it was out? How far you know, was it? 120 yards. I mean, it was, you're were you shooting the e-tip? Yeah. Yeah, that's honestly, that's what I would expect. Like an antelope spot. It was a doe antelope yeah. too. Its own body's only like eight inches wide or 10 inches wide. Like they're not big critters and I didn't hit any major bones. I mean, the exit hole was like marginally bigger, but it wasn't like total carnage where I had to like, you know, scrap an entire quarter. I was very yeah. impressed. I thought I was going to have more damage and I was very impressed to see like, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, no more than any other bullet would have had. No, that and that's honestly what I would expect from that. It, it's funny you say that because I had almost a very similar situation with my doe antelope this year, except for I shot it with a 6 millimeter Creedmoor with a ballistic tip, a 95 grain ballistic mm. tip, and it passed through in the very same situation. Like, not a lot of damage, passed through, not a huge exit hole. Um, so that, that's really what I would expect. You're getting the performance from the e-tip really when you're shooting bigger animals at like two, three, 400 yards, but at mm -hmm. 120 yards going that fast from a 300 wind mag, I would expect to pass through. Oh yeah. Especially, well, I always expect, I get pass throughs. I got pass throughs on most of the elk I shot with it. All of the deer I've shot with it. Um, it's just like a 300 wind make has a lot of energy and yeah. that's half the reason why my gun's 14 pounds and has a muzzle break. <laughs> yeah. Cause I don't, I, I wanted to be able to track my shots mm -hmm. and, um, it saved my bacon one time because I was able to see, you know, I didn't estimate the wind good enough and I had to adjust and dial and then I 12 ringed it, but being able to track your shots was a big thing. And I think the suppressor market is going to really change all of that suppressors i don't hunt suppress anymore you don't or, or you don't hunt oh without suppress. them Sorry. yeah without yeah. them yeah yeah i i was gonna say what <laughs> happened with your suppressor no, i don't hunt on suppress yeah so nozzler makes suppressors too so within the last couple of years i've really gone to test a lot of suppressors and now i'm hunting with them and i won't go back can what's it like to order suppressors so my current understanding and it, it, i think things have been changing recently but when I was looking back into it like three years ago, it was like living in Minnesota doesn't help either, by the way. But it was like they talked about a 12 to 18 month waiting period before from when you decide you want one to when it shows up. And now I'm seeing more companies like Nosler that are selling suppressors. And I'm just curious, is there like changing in legislature or is there different like ways that they're going about it where they can kind of streamline the approval process and, and get them faster than that? Yeah. So Silencer Shop is a huge database of information um, and they actually they sell some of our suppressors online but they came up with the e-filing system so it's all online now and it just has made it like a turn and burn much quicker so where we were seeing like a year and a half wait time they they said down to three months which i actually know a couple people that have gotten them at the like the 90 day window but we're more regularly seeing them around nine months okay so it's a November right now. Like if you got yourself a silencer for Christmas or a suppressor for Christmas, yeah. you would probably be ready for next season. Yes. Does it change? Do you have to like change your zero or any of your sighting in on your rifle when you add a suppressor to your gun? You, when you add anything to your rifle, you're going to want to re-zero it, but chances are it's not going to change a whole lot. Suppressors actually have a tendency to slightly speed up your velocity. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you just want to re-zero it. Okay, and is that just because it's a basically a longer barrel then? Because longer That's barrels because usually increase. Of the way the gases move as the bullet goes through the suppressor, the way the gases move around through the baffles. Oh. So it just like pushes your bullet a hair faster. Interesting. 
Well, I like the sounds of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in most cases, you're probably going to have really close to the same zero at 100 yards. But yeah. Um, I know a lot of people like to zero at 200 and then they just hold instead of dialing. So you would definitely want to re zero. Does it get a little annoying with the extra length of your firearm? So there's pros and cons. Uh, yeah. We actually just earlier this year, we launched a K can, which is a much shorter can. So it's five inches. It's an aluminum, aluminum titanium uh, can. And it's much lighter, much shorter than some of the other cans you see on the market. Mm. So we have a full size too, and it, this new K can's two inches shorter. And I have the barrel on my um, 28 is a 26 inch barrel, and it's it's not that big of a deal to add on that can. I did okay. go to it. I had a long can on it, and it seemed really long, so I switched to the shorter one, and I, you don't really even notice it. Okay, because I was gonna say my gun already is like really long, and yeah. it's got like a. I can't remember if it's a 28 or a 30 inch barrel, but it's got a muzzle brake on the end of oh, it too. Wow. Yeah. It's a yeah. long, well, it's, I mean, it's not a Nazar. It's a X bolt long range max. I mean, it's like halfway to a chassis rifle. Okay. So I don't know why I bought it for mounting hunting. It's, it's like very <laughs> heavy, but I like shooting it. So well, it's got, matters. it's got the adjustable comb and it's got all kinds of different things that make it look like a sniper rifle and i think that's there a big part of why i bought it if it yeah. look cool <laughs> and hey, it's worked that is a huge factor it is a huge factor um i have a question and i th i'm hoping that you can disprove it okay but i've heard a lot of people just random folks like unsolicited advice that say oh the 28 nozzler the 30 nozzler are barrel burners <laughs> And i've heard I, have you heard that you laugh so you had to have heard that same thing can you like explain what like the truth. Yes. So anytime you're pushing that much powder down your barrel, uh, like the 28 and the 30 have a very large case capacity. So okay. are they going to burn out faster than a seven rim mag or a 300 win mag? Probably. But I'd like to know the people that say that. Have you ever burned a barrel out? Like, that's what I want to know. Because that's that's what I was hoping to like talk about because they're like, I heard somebody say like 500 shots in their toast. I'm like, no. okay, well, that doesn't seem like a lot, but I also can guarantee I have not shot 500 rifle rounds in my life. Exactly. And no, that's, <laughs> I mean, no. Okay. 500 that's... rounds is not the barrel life of a 28 Nosler. So. Okay. Well, I mean, unless you go into some like very cheap manufacturer that just happened to package it in a 30 or a 28 Nosler, but I, I assume we're talking like quality, you know, established Quality. rifle companies yeah factory yeah. ammo i mean if people are loading their own they're still within certain parameters as far as right powder charge goes but yeah i think it's funny when people say that and i get where they're coming from they're looking at the the longevity of their investment these things aren't cheap to buy but i would just like to know how Who's many burnt people actually out. burned out their barrel yeah i would like to know as well especially like for someone that lives in Minnesota, like maybe you get to hunt one animal with a rifle per year in your home state. And if you're traveling out of state to rifle hunt, you're not doing a lot of them. Most people yeah. are, for example. Yeah. yeah. So I think I was like, that's where I was at with it. It's like, it does not seem like it's founded. It seems like it's like people are quick to like judge any little thing they can with something that's new. And when it's yeah. new, everyone's like, oh, it's going to be a barrel burner. Look at how fast it's going. Or look at how much powder it's got. And it's like, I don't know. I've never shot one. It doesn't seem like someone would just release a product that's not going to last very long, especially a company as old as Nosler. Yeah. Yeah. People say that all the time. And I've never actually found someone that that was the true case with. Um, but yeah, most people aren't shooting their rifles that much anyways or at least they're not like going out and target practicing with a 28 nozzle like the cost of ammunition itself is going to prevent someone from going out and shooting right a ton of rounds through it so right i'm sure if you had like a three gunner using like a 28 nozzle yeah, yeah you know he might eventually burn out a barrel but he's going to burn out any barrel like that's anyways, the nature yeah. of the game at his level or her level i've heard um, like just that number of rounds you're shooting, but yeah, the, the cost thing is kind of prohibitive to just your average hunter to go out yeah. and shoot 500 rounds in the span of a couple of years. I mean, I don't know. What's that? That would be what? 25 boxes of shells. 
Yeah. So that's like, yeah, I would never, I guess I would never let that deter me from, even if that were the case. So let's say 500 rounds down your barrel. I would never let that deter me from buying a 28 nozzler because the performance, the performance is, it speaks for itself. Yeah. I think that I've had, I have a buddy that had a 30 nozzler that he Mm -hmm. really loved. And that one, to me, it was like, that would be the ultimate, like, big game like if i was a yeah. dedicated moose hunter and elk hunter and that's all i cared about like maybe that's the the strategy like the 28s like halfway between the 26 and 30 you know ironically of course but like it can do the job of both mm-hmm. but if you wanted to like that would be a really cool like setup to have like your 26 for your deer and antelope and then your 30 for like your elk and moose the 30 is a great cartridge as well i have one at home they actually yeah. the 28 and the 30 have the same case capacity they're just shooting different diameter bullets Oh, really? So is there, so then they're really like, you would be splitting hairs deciding between the two, like either one are pretty close to the same. Yeah. Some people are just so adamant on shooting a 30 cal. I wonder like what the, like what your like impact difference would be between a 0.284 and a 0.30 if they're both 180 grain like e-tips. Yeah, I'd have to look. Like, I don't think there's, like, a note. I, I feel like at that aspect, you're not going to have a noticeable difference. I'm sure the 28's got slightly better ballistics. Mm-hmm. So yeah, can... it does. And so with my 30, with my 30 nozzler, I had it custom built. So I had the chamber throated out so that I could load the bullets longer because the Sammy overall case length on that factory 30 nozzler doesn't let you, in my opinion, get the full performance out of that round. Oh, okay. So do you do you reload your own then? Yeah. I suppose you work at the best place in the world to reload <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shit. You can, hey, this isn't quite working out the way I wanted it to. Well, yeah, you obviously shoot like, and then when you reload, it's probably all Nosler components anyway. So it's whether it's like whether you guys make it or I make it, I'm still shooting Nosler ammo. Yeah, and it depends. Like, it's not always in my best interest to reload stuff. Like, I shoot factory 28 Nosler in my 28 Nosler, and it it's my gun at 100 yards is shooting like, groups like that yeah <laughs> with factory ammo i'm like you you can't beat this my time to go reload this like i can't beat what the factory can produce so. i would love i love the like i love entrepreneurship and building things and and i have another podcast dedicated for that and at one point i thought it would be so fun to build like a little home office like reloading station but then i'm an electrical engineer so i wanted to add robots and make it like fully <laughs> autonomous and I'm like, okay, to do that's gonna like cost a ton. So it's like, and then I did the calculation, like, well, how much would I have to shoot for the ammo to be cheaper mm-hmm. than buying it? And then I'm like, wait a second, like, I can't shoot, I can't afford that much. Like, I can't afford to shoot that much, and I don't want to shoot. That would be like, it would be like a hundred rounds a day downrange for me to make. Like, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's definitely not cheaper by any means, but no. there's instances where you want to have the precision over what you're loading. Oh yeah, and I think there's like if you're a if you're a long range competitor at the highest levels, and you just have a like you probably have a custom built rifle that's gonna like like we already talked about, it's gonna like its its own little tweak on a bullet, mm-hmm. and and if you can figure that out and make it that way, like yeah, great. I mean, you can't build a a company that's you know catering to that custom rifle and then you know have the same bullet that's built for that custom rifle, and then everyone else that hunts with you know off the shelf rifles and it's like, you know, like it's not going to like, you can't do that. Like if you're going to be at that highest level, you're probably going to want to reload your stuff anyway. And we'll yeah. give you the components to do it and help you. But you're probably going to find you want something a little different than like what would fit most. And we have to build what fits most for the shelves. Yes. Yeah. And I would say too, rifles can be finicky. So yeah. there's a definite benefit to being able to do load development and swap out powders and, bullets and see what really works best in your rifle yeah if you if someone came up to you and asked they want to get into western hunting like just general western hunting they're you know so you probably assume like it's going to be more antelope deer maybe an elk every now and then they're not going sheep grizzlies crazy animals right off the Mm -hmm. bat and they're like where should i start with like what bullet to pick because if you go online and ask like what's the best caliber for X, Y, or Z, you're going to get a lot of conflicting advice out on the internet. So what would, what would Maddie's um, recommendation for a newer Western hunter be? 
My recommendation would be a 28 nozzler. And that's not just because I work here. Um, I, I truly believe in that round and its performance over even a seven rem mag. Um, but secondary, I would say seven rem mag or 300 wind mag. You, you can't go wrong okay. with those. Um, ammo availability, availability is good. I mean, pretty much anywhere is going to sell ammo for any of those. So Yeah. Well, two of those have been around since like the dawn of time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's very comforting. Um, would you change... Would you downgrade or not not downgrade, but would you decrease the size a little bit if it was like a younger hunter or maybe like someone with a smaller frame? Like a like my wife's only five foot three. She's not a big she's not a large person. She's a very tiny person. And so we're looking at buying her a rifle because she wants to go rifle animal hunting next year. And I must I must like I'm a nerd about everything. So I'm like, here's this option. There's that option. And yeah. she's like, realistically not going on a moose hunt anytime soon. And if we are going on a, you know, an Alaskan moose hunt, I think we can afford to, to get a rifle for the occasion <laughs> at that point. So I would say for, I would say a six, five Creedmoor or a six, five PRC. Yeah. Um, you have a 300 wind mag. So she, if she wanted elk hunt, she could shoot your wind She'd mag. make me carry it though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so i would say you could go down to a 6.5 prc or 6.5 creedmoor i will say my mom so my mom had never hunted before yeah. and she shot her first elk this year and she shot it with my 28 nozzler and she said i love this rifle and i was like so, wow so, okay well so maybe that's something to think about like i think everyone used to think oh you know i have a 12 year old that i want to bring out I don't want to give them my 300. It barks. Yeah. Well, would you, would it be a better question to say like, should I just stick with the two twenty eight Nosler, but then get a suppressor right from the beginning. And so that yes. it's not an issue anymore. I, and I would say your rifle manufacturer also matters. Like there's so many things that go into that recoil stock, what it's made of the right. bedding of the barrel, like the bullet, everything. Um, so my 28 Nosler is a Seekins, havoc ph2 and the recoil it's like uh it's like pushes you back just like a hair it's like a it's like a push not like a hit is it like a, almost to like a 223 no not like not not that not like, that yeah but it doesn't it doesn't hurt it doesn't boot you it doesn't make you flinch or you know jerk the trigger it's just like a nice like i don't know it's yeah. so fun to shoot i love it probably it. has a really good dampener in the stock that's like yeah. Like, because a rifle is a very short burst of energy. And if you have, like, a great dampener that can just take all that energy and then dissipate it slower on your shoulder, like, you can take way more energy into your shoulder and it feels better instead yes. of, like, a quick little pop. Yeah, and Seekins makes all their own stocks. They're um, out of Idaho. But look into them for her because their their rifles are very reasonable for what you get. And that's my, that's my rifle that's shooting factory ammo in, like, oh, really? a quarter-inch group at 100 yards. The bummer is that she's left-handed, so we wow. can't share. We can't share guns. Which, well, we could. She shot her first white tail with my shotgun, but it's a semi-auto, so it's like yeah. re, it's ejecting right in front of her face, which is not a recipe so for long-term success. Limit rifle manufacturer as well. I really wanted her to like just switch. Like, hey, we <laughs> haven't we haven't hunted rifles in a long time. Maybe you could just like practice with the others and we tried it once it didn't work at all <laughs> it did okay. not work at all well it's like her eye dominance matches her hand dominance and like my brother's is opposite and he just figured out how to shoot right handed with left eye dominant but he has yeah. to close his eye always so i don't know everyone's got their own opinion on whether you should keep your off eye open or closed but yeah we'll probably get her i want to get her set up with something that's really works for her yeah and then i'll just use Maybe we just need two of certain things, and that's not the end of the world. But, yeah, we're looking at what caliber, all kinds of things, and um, I want her to, like, get excited about it. So I was yeah. going to plan to say, like, here's, like, a couple calibers I think would be really cool. But as far as guns go, like, here's a couple brands that would be really cool. And then uh -huh. you kind of do what you want. Uh, I don't think she's going to really care what caliber. She's just going to tell me to pick the caliber that works, and then she yeah. can pick the gun that she wants or likes. Yeah, in that case, if you're looking for just one rifle, one caliber, I'd say 6.5 PRC, 28 Nosler, or 7 Red Mag. I really like the 28 Nosler. I also like the naming of it. The branding of it's really cool, I think. Yeah, they did a good job with that. Yeah, was that were you part of that decision? I 
unfortunately was not. Oh, shoot. You had to be humble. You could have said, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then this would be the first podcast that, like, senior management of Nosler listens to. And that would, <laughs> wouldn't be good for either one of us. But, no, I think that's a really good recommendation. And that, that's something that I need to start thinking differently about is not to, like, change the caliber to avoid the recoil or any of the downsides. It's just, like, you can get suppressors now in almost every state that it applies to. And, like, my – you know, we live in Minnesota, I think is one of the hardest states to actually get the paperwork. But we're not going to hunt in California or New York. So, mm-hmm. you know, we we should probably start getting some of those. Because I have a muzzle brake, a huge muzzle brake that really works well, but it is so loud. I usually have to shoot with like double ear protection. Yeah, I would say focus more on something that she's comfortable shooting mm-hmm. rather than the caliber. Because with... A smooth trigger press, a good rest, something she's going to want to practice with, like is enjoyable to shoot. Those things to me matter more than the caliber. Yeah. And there's, I think that's something that a lot of people like to get too deep into the rabbit holes of like which caliber. Like I had a buddy that likes shooting like his 284 Ackley and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to buy one of those. Like that's <laughs> very nuanced and I'm probably yeah. not going to find ammo if I lose it or forget it something yes. on a road trip. But yeah, I think like all of the calibers we've talked about are all plenty lethal, right? The very ethical choices for like lower 48 game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And something she's confident shooting in, she like, she'll yeah. be good. If she can practice with it, be confident with it, enjoys it, she's going to be more likely to hit the sweet spot and then it doesn't matter. <sighs> Yeah, and she really likes the thought of antelope hunting because she's seen Randy's antelope hunting videos and just, like, how much fun he has and, like, road tripping, snacks in the truck, you know, glassing, seeing tons of animals. She's like, I want to do that. I'm like, that's way better than the elk hunt where you go nine days and don't even see an elk. So, and we've been there before. (laughs) Yes. So, awesome. Awesome. Well, we're coming up right on an hour and I really appreciate you being here and giving us the time talking some rifle calibers with us, what it's like to hunt with a significant other, especially <laughs> a significant other that grew up hunting a different way. Um, I think it's very insightful. So I want to appreciate um, your time and thank you for being here. And before we go, I'd love to give you the opportunity to share with folks where they can find you, um, follow your adventures, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, so I really, my main platform's Instagram. You can follow me on there. It's at Maddie Woodward. It's M A D I three eyes Woodward. M A D three eyes Woodward. All right, yeah, we'll put it in I the got show married, notes. Someone had already had the Maddie Woodward. So. And Maddie with two eyes? Well, or did you just skip ahead? I felt like it would look <laughs> weird if it if I had two eyes. Like, does it look like there's actually two eyes on my name? I had to make it so it didn't look like. That was actually how my name was spelled. But I almost messaged a girl and be like, dude, 200 bucks. I'll take, I'll swap you Instagram handles or, but no. That would be funny. Yeah, that would be kind of weird to like, we had, I used to work for a a brand called bowhunting.com. And he had to, Todd uh, Graff had to buy the URL bowhunting.com from someone in Canada. And it was a lady that would make like handmade bows for like gifts. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he said he had to pay a lot of money to get that url um so yeah it's kind of funny because like parents have been like reserving instagram handles for their yeah. babies but imagine so having weird. to like think about like who are the people i could potentially marry <laughs> or like you start dating with someone and you're like so i guess it doesn't really apply to men maybe in the future it will apply to men but let's hope not like you start dating someone and you're like should i like just like make an Instagram and reserve <laughs> like the potential name that I might have in three years. Yeah. So awesome. Well, we'll put the lo- the links down in the show notes for anyone um, and uh, point them right over. But thank you for being here, Maddie. I appreciate your time. Um, thanks for sharing all the stuff with, with the listeners and thank you for listening folks. <laughs>